This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and we continue our series in Daniel. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and all that you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds will be open and receptive to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at our translation of what we have of chapter 7 up to this point. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind while he was lying on his bed. Then he wrote down a summary of the dream and told these words. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Then four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion with wings of an eagle on it. I watched until its wings were pulled off, and it was lifted up from the ground so that it stood on its feet like a man, and a heart of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, was like a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth and between its teeth. And thus they were saying to it, Arise and devour much meat. After this, while I was looking, behold, another like a leopard, with the four bird wings upon its back. The beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. In verse 7, we come to the fourth beast, the one that we are going to spend some time on looking at, because that is the one that mostly concerns us. Daniel 7.7 7. After this, while I was still looking in the night visions, then behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. And it had large iron teeth, which devoured and crushed to pieces, and what was left it trampled with its feet. It was different from all the beasts which were before it, and it had ten horns. The beast here is not symbolized by one single animal. That is because it does not resemble a familiar animal or, in a, or any animal at all, in fact. In fact, its description is more with what it does to its enemies and how frightening it is. It's described as dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. Dreadful means it's something to be feared, to be afraid of. Terrifying has the idea of being terrible, producing terror, terror in its subjects. Also, it's extremely strong, indicating that it's very powerful. It's describing as it had large iron teeth which devoured, devoured and crushed to pieces. Large iron teeth indicate unusually powerful teeth. The teeth being the part that bites and nothing less than iron would stop it. So what we're describing here as we will proceed through our study will anticipate what we're describing here is a powerful army powerful teeth the iron so we're talking about a powerful army basically an unbeatable army it devours and crushes and tramples so this fourth beast has a powerful army. 
Now, these are all active participles telling us that this is a continuous action. It was an army on the move as it crushes and, and defeats its enemies. Described as devouring and crushing and trampling with its feet. The pieces that were left from its attack with its iron teeth were trampled into the ground with its feet, analogous to a powerful army. Let me show you a map of Rome. Now this is one of the maps that you might find in some of your Bibles. It's a well-known and a popular map. Now it's rather large, so I can't show you all at once on this screen. But if you have a study Bible, or you will probably have something similar to this map. I'm going to start from the eastern side of the empire. It reached as far as Parthia. Now, at one time, they did capital, uh, did uh, capture the capital, Parthia. But they often gave them trouble, and you have mountainous regions there, which often hold up an army. But you can see, as we begin to look at this, that Rome covered a large area all the way to Parthia. Um, you see down to the south to Egypt. Of course, Arabia there is a desert that wasn't much worth conquering. And then as we move across, we see the entire Mediterranean controlled by the Roman Empire all the way over to Britain. Now this map is 117 AD, the greatest extent of the Roman Empire. I think Trajan was the ruler at this time. And many of these colored, coded boundaries are the provinces of Rome. It was broken up into provinces and in the way it was ruled. Let's go back to a little more central area where we see down here Palestine down in the bottom right. All right, so that gives you some idea of the huge empire of Rome. Now, Palestine, as you can see, it was a very small part. Some describe it as being in the backwaters of the Roman Empire. And you can see it was on the close to the edge of Arabia, so it was not really a major um, power especially under the rule of Rome. So it was just, we might say, another province. So let's keep that in perspective when we study this beast. It was a monster. It controlled, as you can see, pretty much all the civilized world at this time. If you've studied any of the uh, writings about um, Caesar, uh, the northern part of Europe in here, Germania, this was basically tribes and uh, Rome controlled their borders with their military, their powerful military. But as you look at this map, I want you to notice several features. Notice the northern coast of Africa. Today, of course, we have Morocco, Morocco and uh, Libya and Egypt along these borders. You move over to Egypt, pretty much in the same place still. And of course, some of these countries are different now. We still have Syria above Palestine to some degree. We have Jordan over there, which you don't see on the ancient maps, but it exists there on the um, east side of the Jordan. But you can look at a, a, uh, another map, a more modern map, to see what these countries are today. Now, keeping this map in mind, because this is going to be part of the rising beast that we're talking about right now. So when we see the iron-teethed animal, or whatever you want to call it, the creature, this is a description of the army of Rome. Just to give you a brief history, by 168 BC, the army of Rome had reduced Macedonia, that's the old Greek area, uh, down to a Roman province. 
Their naval fleets and vast armies, superior weaponry and tactics had few setbacks, but they crushed pretty much everyone in their way. So that by 146 BC, Rome was in control of nearly the entire Mediterranean basin, as we can see. They also controlled large parts of North Africa, and of course Greece and Spain were under their control. But they were not done. They moved on up into Europe, and by 41 BC were ready to invade Britain. With a short, within a short time, all of southern Europe, south of the Rhine Danube, was under their control. The only remaining threat was Parthia to the far east, which in 115 AD Trajan took their capital. They also conquered Armenia, crossed the Tigris, and captured the, uh, well, actually it's talking about the Parthian capital at the time. All right, so we see the extent of Rome. Around the vast Roman world were stationed legions of armies to protect the borders and maintain order within the empire. And no doubt this was the longest lasting and most powerful beast for centuries. So clearly the fourth beast is Rome. It consolidated peoples and nations and lasted much longer than any other empire. Now one more thing before we move on to the Ten Horns. Let's talk about the Iron Teeth. Remember the iron legs of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's vision in chapter 2? We have a match of iron here indicating that the Iron Teeth relate to the legs of iron. The action of the Fourth Kingdom the legs of iron, we might say, also crushes and shatters everything to pieces. So there's a tie-in back again with chapter 2 and the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the reason this beast is not identified with any one or two combination of earthly beasts, as I mentioned earlier, is likely because its variety of traits. There were no two or three beasts on earth that resemble it. It was a different beast. I almost want to think it's more mechanical, like a robot made of steel, as opposed to something like a leopard or a bear. But it is a different beast, and I think that is something we need to understand. Let's look at a chart now of comparison between our statue and our four beasts that Daniel's seen. This completes the list down to the fourth empire, but we haven't discussed the ten horns that's coming up soon. The head of gold, it's aligned with wings, is Babylon, the chest arms of silver, it's the bear, Medo Persia, the belly thighs of browns, is the leopard with four wings, which is Greece, the legs of iron, a dreadful and terrifying beast, is Rome. So, this dreadful and terrifying fourth beast is the Rome of past history. That which defeated Greece um, and continued up through the time of Christ, the apostles, the fall of Jerusalem, and then a uh, few more hundred years as it starts to uh, lose its power and influence over that part of the world. It was different from all the other beasts, as Daniel points out in this verse and that it had ten horns. Now, it's important to note that when he says it was different, it really is different. It's not like any other empire. Uh, it's different in several ways, but in particular it's pointed out in that it had ten horns. Let me, I'm not going to try to do this in any detail, but let's just attempt to say that this was the head of the beast. And on this beast, it had ten horns. All right? Now, 
there is an absence in history of a ten horn kingdom or ten nations. In other words, there's nothing in past history that relates to this ten horns. Unlike what we saw with the previous beast, there's a real absence of what these ten horns refer to in history. Never did an empire have ten kings or ten rulers or a coalition all at one time or ten provinces that this points to. So where do we look for an interpretation? Well, if we recall the previous vision of Daniel, or I should say of Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel's interpretation of that dream, we don't have to look too far to remember that in chapter 2 we saw the ten toe kings in Nebuchadnezzar's dream at the bottom of the multi-metal statue. So there again we have a connection. Now horns in scripture usually represent power. People would look at an animal like a goat or a ram or depending on what part of the world you looked at, you would see the horns of an animal and realize that that was one of its weapons that was symbolic of power. So when you see ten horns here, we're representing either ten kings or sort of some sort of um, concentrated power in ten different um, ways. Uh, you could say a coalition of nations perhaps which I think is the direction we're going to end up going. But we have ten um, entities of power. Perhaps that's the best way to put it. Ten regions, ten dominions are depicted here. And of course, as I said, these match up with the ten toes. So let's just write this up here to remind us, okay? The ten toes. And you might also remember that they were a mixture of iron and clay. Now, the other thing that makes sense, if you recall, we didn't see anything in the vision that happened in history with the Ten Toes. And the same is true here. We have not seen anything happen in history with Ten Coalitions or Kings. So again, they match up. And again, this looks to the future. Not yet fulfilled. So we are back to what many call the revived Roman Empire, the popular name, or what I have called it Rome II. So in the future, there will be a confederation of ten kings or ten rulers that make up a large coalition of nations. Uh, <clears throat> now, when I say coalition, I mean each horn is a coalition in itself. Alright? Perhaps two or three, four or five nations will combine to form a coalition and then have some sort of uh, administrative leadership over it. We could expect economic, uh, military powers shared, uh, trade of course, and they're allied for different reasons like national defense. Prophecy uh, interpreters have suggested things like NATO, uh, the common market, the European market, uh, the European Union as some sort of basis for this as these things have formed more recently. And that certainly is a possibility. Now the reason I don't really like the name Revive Rome because I think it limits it. <clears throat> uh, Rome too, I think, will be much larger than the revived Roman Empire. Perhaps twice or three times larger. And we will see what I mean as we move through our study. Now, we know from other books and our own study and what you've seen and perhaps in Thessalonians that um, these ten nations will eventually move to a centralized control. And we see that when the Antichrist takes over. 
All right, but we're going to see what happens as this forms up here in a few moments. So it moves from a confederation of, it will move from a confederation of coalitions to a federation. We have more centralized control, which will come under the Antichrist. As things are now, with what we know of history, there may be some countries that unite in some way now. Uh, for instance, you have the Muslim countries. Uh, they are somewhat united against the rest of the world, even though they certainly have their own differences among each other and fight each other. Uh, there are some geographically, like the uh, North African countries from Morocco across to Egypt. And we have those who have things in common, like some of your European countries who might um, combine to form powers themselves, perhaps Greece and Italy, for example. Now, we've seen twice now, including Daniel 2, that this future kingdom is a distant extension of the old Roman Empire. So what I kind of anticipate, and again, I'm not a, prophet or a son of a prophet, but if you have the old Rome, I'm going to draw kind of an old Rome down here, okay? There's your Mediterranean, okay? Your Mediterranean Sea here. And you have North Africa in here. Uh, if you have these nations forming up somehow, let me do that again. That's the Mediterranean, all right? If you have these nations forming up to some degree and forming up these coalitions, you could come up with 10 fairly easily, okay? You have England up here, of course. And I think we're going to have a much larger group than this. I think it's going to cover a much larger area when this all comes down to it. But we're not there yet, and you can't be too firm on this. You have to be flexible until it happens, actually. But much of the same old territory as the old Rome, and likely, like I said, much more. So there's going to be more people, more land mass. Of course, there's already a lot more people right now. Very powerful military and law enforcement to control the masses and economy. That will be all-encompassing, a powerful economy, a standard of living that will benefit most. However, there will be a, a decreasing acknowledgement of the true God and his truth, and increasing tolerance of everything except true Christianity. Now, we know from Thessalonians that there will be a strong deluding influence over the people to worship and follow the Antichrist. Now, we're anticipating, of course, there will be a call for world unity and one world government. Now, this is right out of ancient Babel and the book of Daniel on Babylon. Now, just a reminder, in Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, the toes were a mixture of iron and clay, showing us two things about this confederation of states. Let me get down here. Let me do a little. All right, there's the Mediterranean Sea. All right. They do not adhere well together. Something is causing a problem among these nations. There will be a conflict before the Antichrist gets complete control, and then he'll be able to do what he wants to with the Christians and the Jews, as far as God allows him. And this is where much of the brutal force will come in. He will crush opposition as he gets his control and maintains it. Now, remember we saw that Rome, too, is a beast like none other. It's out to dominate and crush opposition, opposition that gets in its way. There will be an unprecedented combination of evil and force for the Antichrist to shape his kingdom. Now, if we are alive at that time, what we will witness is a rather incredible amount of people convinced that this is the world's savior. And I don't mean that in the sense of the Messiah, though they will later, 
but they will think this is the answer we've been looking for to get the world together like it should be so we can all get along and be prosperous. Like us, Daniel began to think really hard as he looked at this ten-horned beast. And I want you to look at verse 8 at this point. Let's go forward. So Daniel is looking at this ten-horned beast, verse 8. While I was thinking hard about the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up between them, and three of the first horns were torn up by the roots from before it. And behold, eyes as a man were in this horn, and a mouth speaking great things. This verse has a lot of information. We need to look at it one piece at a time. The first phrase, while I was thinking hard, the hith pa el participle, it's reflexive, he's thinking himself. Sakel, considering, contemplating. While I was thinking hard about the horns, Daniel tells us, he was thinking about the ten horns, what could it mean? As he was looking at them, another horn, a little one, came up between them. Let me draw the head again. I'll go back to the previous map. It's pretty. Um, here we go. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? As he's looking at these ten horns, Picture them however you want to on some sort of beast. Another horn, a little horn, came up between them. All right. Little enough. I want you to get that impression. It's little. It's little compared to the rest. I see this little horn coming up between seven and three of the horns. That's the way I view this comes up between them. Then he describes, and three of the first horns were torn up. So, these are torn up by the roots from before it, from before the little horn. The word for torn up, kind of a rare form, it's, of course, we're in Aramaic, it's P-L, perfect, means past completed action they were torn up it's taken care of they're gone the word for uproot car it's uprooted to the point there's no root so when you pull something up with the roots that means there's not going to be any growth there again now, we'll look elsewhere later to see what this means exactly, but the fact is that three of these horns are taken out by the roots from before the little horn. Then the little horn gets a little description here. And behold, it has eyes of a man who sees and speaks great things. So he boasts. Okay, he boasts. He pridefully boasts on what he does, maybe what he did, and what he will do. Daniel tells us, though, while he was thinking about these horns, these ten horns, this little horn comes up. It has the eyes of a man, and it's a talker. He's, a, he's got a big mouth, as we might say today, and he boasts a lot about himself, about what he's going to do, uh, you can, it sounds like a politician, all the promises he's going to make. Now, with this idea in mind of what we're looking at, let's go through this and look at some of the key features point by point. I'll put these on the board. The word behold turns our attention to another horn not one of the original ten, implying it's not necessarily of the old Rome or the old European uh, part of Rome. 
two. It is little. It is little in relation to the other ten horns. Three. It came up among or between three of the original ten horns. That's my interpretation. It comes up between them. That's what it says. I take it as between uh, the three, the third one and the seventh, or the third one and the fourth one, because it's going to tear up the first three. Now this also tells us that he is a contemporary of the three kings. He is around when these other kings are around, if we just assume they're kings for the sake of trying to interpret this. But they're all rulers at the same time. So in some fashion, point four, three of the kings are uprooted before the little horn. And five pull up by the horns, by the roots rather, probably indicates that this is done violently, quickly, with no possibility of them getting their power back. <clears throat> Point six. Now we learned that it has eyes, as or resembling a man and a mouth. But it's not said to be a man. However, with eyes and a mouth, it's at least man-like. And it's these two characteristics. 7. This passage fits well into our understanding of the Antichrist, a powerful being, human, but also he could have angelic powers. 8. The point being that this small horn is not a nation, but a power that takes down three of the kings or coalitions. Now, like I said, we don't see here how he takes down the three. But he is the point of force, you might say. The leader. However he does it. And we, though you may know how this turns out, we're going to wait till we get to some of those passages to give the uh, final interpretation. Point nine, why are eyes mentioned? Eyes see what is going on. This man is well aware of what is going on around him. So this horn takes in everything around him. He's not all-knowing, but he knows a lot, lot, a lot more than the average human would. Indicates an extensive intelligence system, too, by the way. Ten. Speaking great things tells us he uses his mouth a lot, bragging about what he's going to do, has done, is about himself. He's also skilled at speaking. He's able to persuade people and get his way. The great things he speaks are probably the great promises he can bring to people, what he can accomplish. In verse 25, we learn that his speaking includes speaking against God and persuading people that laws need changing especially against believers. Point 11. Add to these facts that from what we saw earlier, the ten nations do not function really well together. There is a fundamental difference among them. Well, from this point, Daniel, thinking about the horns on the beast, Another scene comes up before Daniel's eye. Now this is interesting because it's like the curtain closes quickly and opens again. And this time it's a completely different scene. So we go from this ten horned beast and a little horn in verse 8 to verse 9 where we not only see a completely different scene but we go into poetry. The Aramaic goes into a poetic style here, and as you can see as I copied it, it's not uh, prose, it goes into poetry. Verse 9. I was looking until thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and his head as pure wool, and his throne was ablaze with fire, its wheels a burning fire. Now there's a lot here also, but notice how quickly the scene changes. The scene changes basically to heaven. We see 
thrones set in place. Thrones is in the plural here. So there are other thrones and uh, persons upon these other thrones. But we're not told who. We'll have to wait for that. Well, Daniel observes a courtroom being set up. On one of the thrones, the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now, the title Ancient of Days indicates advanced in days. It means advanced in days. A way, saying, a way of saying he has been around a long time. Now that we are looking at a future vision with Daniel, that would mean he was an eternal being. This is God. To make it more clear, this is God the Father. The first person of the Godhead of the Trinity. He takes his seat, meaning that he is about to act as judge. Now you might write a right away think well it, it seems like it might likely be more the second person of the trinity but just just wait till we get the next several verses you'll see why we interpret this as the god the father his clothing is white symbolizing purity his head is pure wool white hair which goes with being old also purity also wisdom his throne was ablaze with fire. Let's talk about the throne for a moment. The throne. Ablaze. With fire. So you picture in your mind some sort of throne with a bunch of fire shooting out from it. Flames of fire indicate judgment, purification. This is a judgment throne. The throne has wheels, telling us that this is uh, kind of like a chariot throne. It's mobile. It moves when necessary. So however you picture this in your mind, perhaps like a huge uh, wheelchair, whatever, okay? It has flames coming out of it. And we have this Ancient of Days sitting on it. This is not a very good depiction, but it's an attempt. Fire shoots out of its wheels. Everything we see and hear about the throne indicates that this is a throne from which some very serious judgments are made. All right? Remember, there's other thrones too. Let's don't lose that side also. But this is a unique throne compared to these others. All right? And this is the one the Ancient of Days sits on. Kind of picture like chariot wheels or wagon wheels, however you want to see it. But the main points you want to see, the Ancient of Days is sitting on it. It has fire. It's a throne of judgment. And of course, God is pictured, uh, God the Father here is pictured as pure. A perfect and righteous judgment will come out as he executes judgment upon what he wants. Psalm 50 is another description of a courtroom of judgment. We view that more from the Old Covenant, but let's look at that right quick. Psalm 50 verses 1 through 6. Psalm 50 verse 1. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judged. Selah. So this was not an uncommon view of God as judge. 
Well, let's go back to our passage. When does this judgment take place? Now, let's remember. Let's do it this way. We just had a... Well, that's not very good. Uh, let's try this again. Freehand it. We just had a block of information about the fourth beast. All right? It's ten horns, the little horn, and so on. Then we suddenly switch over to a heavenly scene and judgment. Have we seen like something like this before? In Daniel 2, we had the statue, didn't we? We had the statue. The ten toes. We have the stone come down. A picture of judgment. Here we have the fourth beast. And then we have a picture of the throne room. Which anticipates judgment. Now I'm not going to try and interpret everything right now. We're going to wait for Daniel to do that for us as we get to the passages. And later on, we will see the interpretation that he has given of this vision. But I want to give you a little bit here to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Preliminary interpretation, you might call it. And then we'll build on it as we see what the angel gives to Daniel later on in this passage. But what we do want to see here is what Daniel saw. Uh, to envision in our own mind what we're looking at and also recall what we saw back in chapter 2. And then we'll get the full interpretation as the angel tells Daniel what it means. But one thing I do want you to see here, which is indicating here on this drawing, in Daniel 2 we saw the stone come down and strike the ten toes, indicating judgment. Then remember it grew into a kingdom. Here we see the ten horns. A little horn rises, uproots three, and is like a man, knows a lot, is boastful, we see that as the Antichrist here, ruling. Then the next scene in heaven is judgment is about to occur. Well, we'll stop here and continue next time in Daniel chapter 7. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word again. We thank you for the challenges you've given us, the insight into the future. We ask that in the power of your spirit, these things will be made real to us as one day we may be seeing some of these things come to life. So challenge us with what we've heard. In Jesus' name, amen.